the interesting things that every time you write a sermon is that first you preach it to yourself. And it's one of the hardest things to do is to preach to yourself. Um, and especially when it comes to texts such as these. Because uh, throughout all of Scripture, all of Scripture, and if, you, if you've ever, I know you, the pastor gonna, is going to pick on the Baptists again. But if, you, if you've been to a Baptist church or you've been to a, a, a Pentecostal church or an evangelical church, they will make sure that you are scared. That's part of their liturgy, their litany. Scare you. You either get scared or you get guilted, but if they're really good, you'll get both. Further, and those are our fellow Christians. Those are fellow Christians. So I'm not saying that they do not believe, and I'm not saying that they do not preach well, because everybody knows a Baptist preacher preaches well. Oh, that Lutherans could preach with the passion of a Baptist pastor. What I'm saying is, oftentimes sermons will not end with gospel, but will end with a decision that needs to be made. Now, if that's true, that a decision needs to be made, then that puts your salvation squarely in your pocket. If it's 1% your responsibility, it's 100% your responsibility. There is no cohesion, there is no, uh, not cohesion, there is no, um, uh, there is no, well, synergism. There's no synergism. There is no cooperation. That's the word I was looking for. There is no cooperation between you and God. If you have to do 1%, you have to do 100%. And so that type of fear is taught. I'm just telling it like it is. And I also tell it like it is by saying this. You should be scared. You should be afraid. If you're not afraid, you're not doing Christianity right. If you're not afraid of the world, you're not doing Christianity right. If you can't look and see what's happening to our own universities, Concordia University systems, and see what's happening. If you can't, if, if you can't see that, uh, that we, we have had to close schools and tell schools to no longer be affiliated with the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod because they have bent the knee to Moloch and offered up their children, pre-born. They have had to make room for the LGBT diversity They had to include gender studies major, which just in general is a bad idea. I don't know what you follow up with that in a career. Unless you want to go be a counselor at another college to teach gender studies, really. That's really the only, only option. Sort of like having a pastoral ministry option or degree. You're, you, you're, you're gonna be a pastor or Nothing. <laughs> but I say all of this because we are standing in the face of a lot of worldly cultures that, you, that we can't be out of touch with. We are in the midst of a cancel culture. Cancel culture being if you said anything against the wrong people in your life, you're uh, your career and your life is expendable and you will be shamed till you're done. That's the world that we live in. 
which means that that leaves a very small gap for Christians to confess Orthodox Christianity. Very small. So when I look at Scripture, all of Scripture, I'm not afraid of the swords that are on fire. I'm not afraid of the cherubim and seraphim. I'm not afraid of revelation. I'm not afraid of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and I'm not afraid of a made up rapture. I'm afraid of this text right here. One on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? This is the, this is the one. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Keep in mind, God and in Christ is all-knowing. So when he says, I do not know you, he is willing himself to no longer have you be a part of him. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what would. And that scares me more than any of the scary, the, 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 the trope scary things in Scripture. And it scares me more than being canceled. It scares me more than not speaking against the evils of this world. It scares me more that if I don't tell you the true law and the true gospel, then you can go out and you can be misled into believing lawlessness. And then that's on me. I will have to make an account for every single one of you. They told us this before we were ordained but I still have yet to wrap my mind around it. I don't think I ever will until I'm standing before my Lord. And I say all of this because it reminds me that when we say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? The Lord reminds us, listen, just because you talk about me doesn't mean you're confessing me. Just because you talk about Jesus doesn't mean you're a Christian. The gospel implied is the gospel denied. You can't just, uh, you can't just imply the forgiveness of sins. You have to forgive people of their sins. That's why Facebook theology is so dangerous. Because you can put up something very vague that sounds good and you say, well, you know, that's, it's God. Okay, well, tell me about this God. Tell me about this God. Because our God is the God of a bloody cross. Our God is the God of an empty tomb. Our God is a God who did not spare His own Son, but would have Him come into the mud and the muck with His people and take on their sin to die for us. Further, I'll say this, and it's because I need to hear it too. There is no sin that you can sin that's greater, more grievous, and more damnable than can God forgive you. You cannot out-sin 
uh, the Christian cannot out sin Christ's forgiveness. Unless you turn your back on Him, which you're therefore by definition no longer a Christian, or you refuse to confess your sin, then we can be assured that God knows us. Because notice in the text in 22 in particular, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? What's the subject there? We did all these things. But we did it in your name. Yes, but they were not my works. They were yours. And when you use the Lord's name for your own benefit, we call that a little thing called blasphemy. And so, just because you say the Lord or whatever, or you hold up your Bible like Joe Osteen and, and confess that it is, it is what you are what it says it is, and then you throw it away and you don't talk about Jesus again, or... You just simply ignore Scripture altogether and give eulogies. Which reminds me, always be weary of pastors who are on call for funeral homes. They're the ambulance chasers of the pastoral world. And they will not preach law and gospel. I say all of this because you should be terrified of your sin. Do not go to false prophets. Be weary of false prophets. Be afraid of false prophets. Then you ask, okay, then how can I know what a good tree is? How will I know what a, what, what a, what a, what a uh, false prophet is? And how, how will I know what not to listen to? And it's simple. Do they tell you, as all prophets have in the past, about Jesus? If they don't preach Jesus, they are a false prophet. And to be perfectly honest, they desire to relieve you of what's in your wallet more than they care about relieving you of what's in your conscience and that I just can't abide by so how do we know how do we know what a good fruit is in a world that calls evil good and good evil The answer is right there. For if you do not receive the spirit of, uh, of slavery, a spirit of slavery, and fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons. So if you are the sons of God, if you are the sons of God, that puts you on equal footing as Christ. That puts you on equal footing as Christ insofar as wherever He is, you will be too. After He died and He rose again, He, through baptism, made you adopted children of God. And if you are adopted children of God, then you are entitled to whatever the Father gives when he dies or in this case the son whatever it is we all know how inheritance works whatever the person who dies has to give it is given to you completely true so when Christ dies 
and he dies for you, and you die in the waters of holy baptism, then everything he has to give, he gives to you. So what then is your inheritance? It's this. You have the forgiveness of sins. And where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. And where there is life and salvation, you cannot be far from Jesus because he's the giver. And you cannot disconnect the gift from the giver. You are the receiver. If anybody preaches another gospel than what I'm preaching to you today, they are false prophets, liar, and they are accountable to God. Damnation and hell will await them. But let me tell you what you get. You get pardon. You get peace. You bear good fruit, not because you go out to bear good fruit, but because God bears good fruit on your behalf. Despite you, God bears good fruit. How do you know that you're a good tree? Because God produces good fruit in you. How do you know that you're a good tree? Because God told you that you're a good tree. You don't, you don't just say, I'm a good tree now. You have to be told. I have a Japanese maple. It is not a good tree. It is dead. I planted it this summer. That was not smart of me. Christ, on the other hand, plants the tree of life on our foreheads with water. And that we call good fruit, good, a good tree that produces good fruit. And the good fruit is this, the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. I am, and that's why this text scares me. It scares me because it forces me into preaching correctly whether I want to or not. I do not have the luxury of an opinion. I don't. I have to preach what Scripture says. And so this text keeps me on the road. It's the third use of the law. It guides me to preach this. Know that your sins are forgiven. And if God didn't begrudge you your, your sins to be forgiven, who are you to not forgive someone else their sins? For it would be better that you were not born than to withhold forgiveness from somebody else. So go and do likewise. Forgive others as you would have Christ forgive you. Because I'll tell you this. This world of hell that we live in. It's not long for this world. The struggles. It's not. In a blink of an eye. It's going to be over. And all that will be left. Is a puddle. And that puddle is right there. And from that puddle grows a marvelous tree. A tree that is cruciform. And on that cruciform tree bears fruit that we get to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins. Daily, every single week, we get to do this. And every time, what seems like an insignificant act, every time I give the body to you and the blood to you, Christ is saying, I know you. I know you. I know you by name. I know you by name. I know you by name. And it's that that gives us all the comfort that we could ever need. So I got nothing left to say. What else would there be to say? Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever.